This training is vocabulary and oral language development. My name is Jennifer Schneckenberg and I am the principal investigator of the Texas Literacy Initiative at the Von Gross Center for Reading and Language Arts at the University of Texas at Austin. Hook em. Woo! Yeah, all right. Love to see fellow horns. I also want to start out this training not just by thanking you for coming here, but also validating that you are principals and you are directors and you know that vocabulary is very important. You know oral language development is very important. You have knowledge of both vocabulary and oral language development and those things are happening in your centers and on your campuses every single day. And so what we're going to talk about today is an explicit instructional routine for your teachers to be engaged in with their students and with the children in their centers while they are working toward enhancing and increasing vocabulary knowledge and oral language. The objectives, maybe, are to look purposefully, and we're going to look at some research on vocabulary instruction. We're going to discuss how teachers should be teaching vocabulary in the classrooms, and then talk about what your teachers will be doing as far as strategically planning for this type of instruction in the classroom. I'd like for you to take a minute and read through this quote and on your three slides to a page, which I didn't go over your materials and that's probably something that I should have done. In, in here, you have your binder. If you will open it up and you will see that you have participant notes. Behind the participant note tab, you have your three slides to a page. You also have tabs for handouts and resources and additional materials. I will take you through the handouts and resources as we work our way through the next two hours. These other materials, cards on rings, and your explicit routine card, front and back, and your vocabulary activities explanation will all be things that we will use later on in the training. So now that you have your three slides to a page, if you wouldn't mind finding on page one this quote at the bottom, and go ahead and underline, highlight, circle, any words, vocabulary that sticks out to you as being really important from this quote. Turn to your neighbor and talk to your neighbor about some of the words that you highlighted or underlined or circled from this quote. Let's come back together in five, four, three, two, one. This table right here, what's the word that you chose? Ownership. Ownership. Okay, and of course, we want our students to be able to own the words, not just pass the words by on a test and be able to ace it and then the next week come back to school without having any idea what that word means, but actually having ownership of words. What else? Do you notice is important? This table here. Multiple exposures. multiple exposures. And then it goes on to say multiple exposures of rich and varied activities that are in relation to meaningful information about the words. Right. So we don't just want to see students finding words in a dictionary, looking them up in the dictionary, and writing down the dictionary definition. We actually want them to have rich and varied approaches to vocabulary instruction that are meaningful so that we can make sure that those neural pathways in their brains start connecting these words to their meanings, to the context that they are used in, so that we can ensure that, those, that the ownership of that word or those words is gained. All right, so Louisa Motes talks about reading as the product of decoding and comprehending language. I really like this puzzle because it takes that notion and looks at it from the specific components of reading and how those are interrelated. So we have decoding. On the decoding side, we have phonological awareness and we have phonics. So within our phonological awareness, we know that there are sounds and sounds are put together to make words and words are put together to make sentences. And in phonics, we map those graphemes to those phonemes so that we can see the words that we're reading, we can see those letters and how they're put together to make words and words that are put together to make sentences. On the other side of the puzzle, we have comprehension where we have vocabulary, so the meaning of the words, and then we have text comprehension, being able to actually understand what it is that the students are reading with fluency being the bridge between. So very quickly, I'm gonna teach you what might be a new word and we're going to take that new word through this puzzle and see just how important vocabulary is for comprehension and overall reading. So the word is going to be mentioned up here, so you might want to look at my mouth because it could be a tricky word. Are you ready? The word is influus. What's the word? Influus. The word is influus. What's the word? Influus. One more time, the word is influus. What's the word? Excellent. Okay, so we're going to start over here on this side of the puzzle for decoding and we're going to think about phonological awareness and what's the first sound, the first phoneme that you hear in the word 
influence. I, I, I. Very good. How about the final sound you hear in the word influence? Excellent. Phonologic awareness check plus. Let's move on to phonics. Pick up a pencil or a pen or something. And somewhere on your three slides to a page, spell out the word influence. What's the word? Influence. Influence. Please spell the word now. Influence. Did you look it up? Put that technology away. <laughs> I did tell your coaches that when they do this training to remind everyone to please put technology away during this part. Okay, so look on your neighbor's paper. Make sure that they spell the word correctly. I'm totally kidding. That's just really mean. I would never do that. I'm going to spell the word influence for you. Are you ready? I-N-F-L-U-O-U-S, influence. All right. Yeehaw. I N. F L U O U S influence. Okay, now we're going to go on to fluency, and I want you to read that word. So, looking down where you either spelled it correctly or you just rewrote it when I spelled it out loud for you, if you would read that word fluency, fluently, ready, one, two, three, read. Influence. Say it loud, say it proud. Influence. Read it like a robot. Influence. Read it like a race car. All right, check plus for fluency. So now let's move on to the comprehension side. For vocabulary, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what the word influence means. Okay, let's come back together in five, four, three, two, one. First of all, I just want to point out that was not vocabulary instruction. What you just saw me do, if, if your teachers are doing that in the classroom, they're not instructing vocabulary, they're assessing vocabulary because I said, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what the word influence means. If you knew what the word influence means, you wouldn't need that to be a vocabulary word that you were working on this week in your vocabulary instruction. So I'm going to give you some context. We're going to go ahead and we didn't really get a check plus in vocabulary because I heard some interesting, <laughs> albeit not G-rated, <laughs> answers. Um, so I'm going to give you some context. Yesterday I made the terrible decision that it would be the day I would decide to be influence. Isn't that so helpful, those context clues? You want me to read it again just one more time? Yesterday I made the terrible decision that it would be the day I would decide to be influence. <sighs> Does that help? Turn to tell your neighbor? Or yeah, not really. I'm going to tell you that um, I, I gave you 18 words in that sentence and you knew 17 out of the 18 <laughs> words, which means that you had a, an accuracy rate of understanding of comprehending 94.4% of that entire sentence. Without the understanding of the word influence, you have no idea what I'm talking about. And on the STAR test, you're just going to skip that question. If you're asked to write about that, you're just going to skip that question, or you're going to make up something not quite G-rated that I heard from the back of the room. <laughs> Influence actually means that you um, are the person who's decided to ignore your horoscope because it's very bad. Did you look it up? You saw it. It's an obsolete word. I have to, with principles, choose obsolete words that are no longer in dictionaries, and you're still able to locate it on Google. <laughs> So do you see how without the vocabulary knowledge, without understanding the one word that is, yesterday I decided to ignore my horoscope because it was bad and it was a terrible decision, is the outcome, the comprehension of that sentence. But we didn't really get that when I was giving you all of the context around it. Because I really didn't give you context, I just gave you words. Words that you knew, yes, but not words that would help you decipher what the word influence was. I also will tell you that you did a lot of things that students do. You tried to think of the part of speech. You tried to decide how that would be used. When you were trying to tell your neighbor, you were using words that you knew that sounded similar, like influence and some other not so great. OK, I'll just stop picking on you back there. <laughs> oh, it was just adorable. So you can find her later, and she'll tell you. So vocabulary is important. Well, let's talk about what is vocabulary. Those are the words that make up the speech oral vocabulary, or the text, reading and writing, and the meanings of those words. 
Now there is a distinction that needs to be made. Where are my directors, early childhood, Head Start directors? Where are you sitting? Where are my elementary principals sitting? And middle school? And high school? Okay, so those of you who raise your hand for elementary and certainly early childhood, the receptive vocabulary, and this is not just only for those, for those um, age and grade levels, but certainly they know exactly what I'm talking about when I say receptive vocabulary because those are the words that students hear and understand either from another human being speaking to them or being read to, the words they hear and understand, but they're not really ready to express them in their own speaking or their own writing. So for example, a child shows up to pre-K on the first day and the teacher asks the child, can you please pick up your jacket and go put it on a hook? The teacher has asked the child to do something. The child responds by picking up his jacket and going and hanging on a hook. But later on, you might ask that child, where did you hang your jacket? He's not going to remember to say hook. So he can understand the words, but he's not ready to express those words or able to express those words. And as we can really see the difference when we get into later elementary, middle, and high school with students not being able to express words in their writing, because maybe when they hear a word that the teacher is telling them and they hear it in context and they're unable to understand it, but they don't own that word. Because if they truly owned that word, it would show up in their expressive writing and they would be able to say, here's the word I learned, I understand that word, I own that word, and now you're going to see it as proof in my writing. So those are the vocabulary, receptive expressive vocabulary, all the words and the meanings of those words. Now what is vocabulary instruction? What is it? There are two different ways to instruct vocabulary. There's the indirect way, and then there's the direct way. Indirect means engaging in really rich discussions in the classroom, having conversation with your teacher, with a peer, where, where vocabulary words are being shared that are at a level that actually brings the conversation higher for those students. Also, when you're doing a read aloud in the classroom, when you're walking in, your teachers are talking about vocabulary, they're doing read aloud, they're really getting into the text, and the students are really getting into the text, and they're supporting vocabulary instruction with that read aloud. Those are all indirect ways. Direct ways, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is using models, demonstrations, and going through an explicit routine where students are told the word, repeat the word, told the definition, and actually instructed in a very explicit way so that that word can be something that they understand from the beginning and then start to get deeper with their processing skills. So this is connecting it to things that students already know, expanding their background knowledge or expanding prior knowledge, et cetera. Okay, so what is vocabulary instruction not? Anybody in here, former teacher, raise your hand and put it high. Because I'm going to tell on myself, but I'm not going to tell on you, but I'm going to tell on myself as a former teacher. I did a lot of what vocabulary instruction is not. I actually had this thing in my room called the who can bird, and it sounded a lot like this. Who can tell me what this word means? Who can use this word in a sentence? Who can tell me the part of speech of this word? Who can read the word? Who can write the word? Who can sound out the word? You know who can, the teacher can, and that's the teacher's job, and so the who can bird needs to be locked away. No more who can in vocabulary instruction. I used to say the who can bird needs to be shot, but I got a lot of negative feedback about that, so I don't say that anymore. So we just lock him away in his little cage, and he can stay there in the corner of the classroom, but we need to make sure that we are setting our students up for success. And the only way to do that is to make sure if the students don't know the word or how to pronounce the word or how to write the word, we don't say turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor what the word influence means. means we say here's the word, here's what it means, you're going to see it in this text and I want you to be successful with it. What else is it not? Limiting student talk. If students are not producing the word in their mouths, they will never use the word. If you are never asked to say the word influence, you will never do what you're going to do tonight, which is go home and make sure that you tell everyone that you learned a new word that doesn't make any sense because who made that word up? I don't know. Um, influence. Okay, so when you said it in your mouth and you felt it in your mouth, it actually felt weird at first. You kind of wanted to say influence because it was a word that you knew. And so if students aren't ever asked to produce words, they're never going to use, we will never know that, that, that they can express them in writing because they're never even going to express them orally. Confining instruction to reading and language arts. This drives me bonkers. I don't know who thinks that a math teacher can't teach vocabulary or that a science teacher can't teach vocabulary or that a social studies teacher can't teach vocabulary, but I will tell you that if we could get all of our efforts together. You know that where I've seen some really great vocabulary instruction? Shop. 
Really great vocabulary instruction with math terms and science terms in a shop class. Because the teacher knew those stu students needed to know to be successful on the project what it was that he needed them to know before they got started. And he needed them to be safe. And so when we think about cross-content area vocabulary instruction, it can really drive home a lot of that academic language that our students don't have if we combine our efforts and think cross-content. It cannot be li limited to ELAR anymore. And then these activities down here, y'all. I used to do that, look it up in the dictionary. Now, there are, there's a place for dictionaries. They are important. We need to be able to know how to use them. But if a student doesn't know a word, and we say go look it up in the dictionary, and then they look it up in the dictionary, and then they gotta look up three more words to figure out what those words mean. By the time it's like, why, what, what was I looking for in the first place? And then this matching words to the definition, word to the definition. How many times have you seen this? Oh, I meant to go here, and okay, yeah. What are we doing? Is that meaningful? Is it rich? Is it varied? It might be multiple, but that's the only thing we're getting out of it. There's nothing rich, there's no, there's no activity, there's no making those neural pathways by using the word, talking about the word. Talk to your neighbor about what you know about that word. What did you know about that word yesterday? What do you know about that word now that you just read this story? And we had this great discussion. So thinking about what we should not be seeing in the classroom, and then placing words on a word wall and never ever using them again. If the words are in the classroom and they're on the word wall, they need to be using those words, looking at those words, being drawn to those words, having anchor charts so those words are in our faces so that we will start using them and understanding them and not just say, oh, those were our words from last week. We don't need to worry about those anymore. All right. I know you all are excited about this. I can tell. I see some smiles. I see some head nods. Now let's get really excited about the standards, Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So you've probably seen the text, I don't know how many times in your lifetime as the director or principal. What we're going to talk about here is how these things build. So very quickly, I'm going to just scroll through. Here are some K-1 standards that are for vocabulary instruction. And here are some two, three standards. You see how they build on one another, and I'll just let you read through that, and I'll stop talking. And on to four, five. So you can see the building. A lot of the words are similar, and then we're just adding a little bit more and a little bit more. Usually when I get to this slide and I'm working with some um, middle school and high school teachers. The middle school teachers are sitting there and the high school teachers say, how come we don't teach them all of this before they come to us then? That these are your texts. And I like to say to that, that this is vocabulary. Maybe with phonological awareness, once we understand that there are letters and they have sounds and we can make all those sounds, we produce all those sounds, we can isolate those sounds, we can manipulate those sounds, we can put a check in the box. For phonics, when we understand how letters are formed and how we read letters and the sounds letter, letters make and how letters go together to make words and we can read those words, we can put a check in the box. But when it comes to vocabulary, there's no end. Even as adults, we're constantly learning. Vocabulary is constantly moving, expanding, growing. I used the example with your coaches because one of them had put together, your, your ELA coordinator had put together a, a lovely example of the word startled. And I thought that was a great example to use with them, startled. If you think about the word start, so let's get down to the very base form of that start, okay, of startled, let's think about start. If you're kindergarten, first grade, what do you think start means? To go, to begin something. Now maybe as you move from first grade into second grade or maybe a little bit later, you, you understand what it means to wake with the start, to be jolted up. Okay, then if you think about the word startled, what does a child have to be able to do to understand that context of the word? Has to be able to know about verbs, has to be able to know that verbs can happen in the past, has to be able to know about suffixes and that ed is something that happened in the past. So if you're startled, that means it happened already. It's not the same thing as startles or startling. And then when you think about the last time you were startled, it could possibly have been this morning in a hotel room when a gecko crawled under your foot, or possibly it could be something different for you. 
Um, but think about the last time you were startled. And really do that, because I'm going to ask you to share with your neighbor. Okay, turn to your neighbor and talk about the last time you were startled. Come back together in five, four, three, two, one. And I'm going to have her share it over here the last time she was startled, because it was quite startling. We were in a trip in San Antonio. We oh, hang on. I'm going to get her a mic, because I don't think. Sorry. I can't take this one off. <laughs> we were in a trip in San Antonio. We walked into our hotel room, and then the front desk gave someone else the same key, so then they went into our room while we were in there. <laughs> we were just unpacking, but it was still like, well, what are you oh. So, yes, do you think she was startled? Absolutely. How else do you think she felt? What other emotions are coming from you right now, knowing that she went through that experience? Uh, very frightened, alarmed. I mean, thank good, I mean, uh, relief that they were just unpacking, okay? <laughs> I'm serious. If you think about all the things that happened to you in your mind when you hear that story, and we're talking about being startled, you have other, other experiences to draw from, and your emotions go to her and think about all of the other things that she was thinking of. She wasn't just startled. She was frightened. She was alarmed. She was grateful. So there are lots of things that can happen when students' vocabulary continues to develop and there's a support for that continued vocabulary development. Because look, it's only going to get more complex. English 1, English 2, I mean, they, the, even the definitions are getting a little bit longer here. <laughs> English 3, and English 4. And what they all have in common is that this is a constantly evolving component of reading. You can't one day say, I know all the words. Well, maybe you can, and I would be really impressed to meet the person who could do that, but I know all the words, and I know all the meanings, and I know all the context, and I know how they're all interrelated. I know everything about vocabulary there is, check in the box. That's saying the same thing about comprehension. I know everything there is to comprehend. I have every metacognitive skill in my tool bag, and I know exactly which one to go to every time I'm reading anything, including a scientific journal. I don't think we can ever put a check in the box on that comprehension side of things. So we really need to think about what it is that our teachers are doing in the classroom when they are with the students, making sure that these standards are being taught, but that they're being taught at such a level and in such a direct and explicit way that students can be set up for success all the time. Okay, so why should we teach vocabulary? I'm pretty sure that there's not a person in this room who would say that it's not important to teach vocabulary, but I do like to talk about this Hart and Risley study, 2003. Anybody in here have children? Put your hands up high. Be proud of them, even if sometimes they make us gray. Anybody in here have nieces and nephews? Grandchildren? All right. I saw you over here raising your hand. What's up with that? <laughs> OK, so you're all professionals. And I'm going to tell you that what they did in this study was they went into these homes when students were, when students, when children were 18 months all the way till they were three years, and they put a recorder on them. They recorded every word that they heard spoken to them from 18 months to three years. Then research is fun, right? They went back to a lab. They counted up all those words, and what they found out was from 18 months to three years, your children in your home heard 1,100 new vocabulary words per month from 18 months to three years. 1,100 new vocabulary words in a month, your children. In working class homes, that number dropped to 700 words, new words per month. We're just talking new words right now. And in our high poverty homes, where we have our lowest socioeconomic students, where they're coming from, from 18 months to three years, those students heard 500 new vocabulary words. Then what they did was they had counted up all the words anyway, and so they extrapolated the data across time and found out that by age four, your children and your nieces and your nephews and your grandchildren had heard 32 million more words spoken, and that's all the words, aggregate words, 32 million more words spoken aloud to them than students from high poverty. Whew, that's like a lot of words, right? 
Then if you think, okay, so those four-year-olds, are, are, they're all going to go to school at four, right? No. Unfortunately, no. They're all going to go at five, right? No, no mandated kindergarten. So perhaps for some of these children, the first time they're going to school is age six. So that gap is bigger than 32 million. And when you think about what your teachers need to be doing at those grade levels with working with oral language and helping develop the love of language and helping students be able to actually express themselves through language and not just keep being receptive with language, that's a huge task. It's also a hugely important task because vocabulary is the key. Vocabulary is the key that unlocks the meaning of text. And I know y'all are principals and y'all have had a long day, but there's not one person in here that I can't make laugh because you have word consciousness, because I can unlock your meanings of your words because you have meanings of words. Does that make sense? Let me read it out loud. Maybe you got some of these emails. They're so funny to me. A chicken crossing the road is poultry in motion. <laughs> Tough nut to crack over here, I gotta tell y'all. I'm coming back to this table. Okay, so it's funny on multiple reasons, right? Chicken crossing the road, that's going to be a joke, right? And then poultry, because you know it's poultry. And then poetry in motion, poultry in motion. Okay. <laughs> How about this one? The man who fell into an upholstery machine is fully recovered. <laughs> All right, I like this. See, here we go. <laughs> okay, but it's funny because you have word consciousness, and the meanings of those words are unlocked for you. In your mind, you have all of the understanding of what it is that's happening here. Like when I say, you feel stuck with your debt if you can't budge it. <laughs> oh, how about a boiled egg in the morning is hard to beat? <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, y'all are a tough crowd all around. Okay, this one is one of my favorites. She had a photographic memory that was never fully developed. <laughs> our, our kids might not even get that because we don't develop film anymore, but I remember waiting weeks and weeks for what they get in one second. The short fortune teller who escaped from prison was the small medium at large. <laughs> you know that's funny. Okay. When an actress saw her first strands of gray hair, she thought she'd die. Why is that funny? Die, she thought she'd die, but you really know that she's going to just color her hair. Okay. So word consciousness, unlocking meanings. Don't we want our students to find humor and to find passion and to find love with words the way that we do? The way that some of us do. I'm just kidding, now I'm giving you a hard time. Okay, and of course, we can read that last bullet there, but you know that direct, explicit, systematic instruction is one of the best ways for students to be able to increase their vocabulary, and especially when we're talking about students who come with such deficits as we just discovered. Anybody in Arlington ISD have English language learners on your campuses? Okay. so. We know that there's research that supports English language learners. I don't understand why we're not doing a better job of translating that into instruction in the classroom. We'll say that English language learner and struggling reader research looks very familiar. Things that work need to be happening, such as have a visual or a picture of the word when it makes sense for students to be supported. Use their native language as a resource. They come with a load of skills and some of those words are what we would call high-level words in English that are cognates in Spanish. If you look at your resource section, if you just flip really quickly to resource one, it's not an exhaustive list. But you have two pages of cognates there, and you can see the Spanish word for the English word. So English-Spanish cognates. And you can see that in some cases, those are very high-level English words. So use that native language as a resource. Of course, we need to support language across the content areas. We really need to think about emphasizing that academic English. There's a researcher in Florida, Maria Elena Arguelles, and she used to uh, teach English in Mexico, and she would tell her kids to read the really dark words. And she told her kids to read the slanted words. Then she was doing a training one day, she said, it never dawned on me that I should have told them to read the bolded words or to read the italicized words. She said, I was dumbing down the language to make them more successful, and the end result is that I was dumbing down the language, period. So when teachers think that they need to dumb down language for students, what they really need to do is give them a scaffold or a paired-in kind of language, a parallel language. Read the slanted words. That means those words that are leaning to the side. Read the slanted words. 
So, slanted words. Oh, y'all, it's been a long day. Italicized. Now, you could have corrected me, but you didn't. You knew that. I was making a, I was making a point, and it flopped. <laughs> Emphasize academic English. Okay. And then teaching the difficult um, words, multi-meaning multi words, multiple meaning words, um, and also making sure that our teachers are screening those texts for unfamiliar words. As a former teacher, I used to love to pick books off the shelf and start reading them to my students, and it turns out that's not always the best way to approach a read aloud. You actually need to look at the book prior to reading it, screen it for unfamiliar text, thinking about ways to setting, for setting your students up for success. We also need to make sure that students are successful in common idioms and phrases. And there are lots of idioms that we use in education, lots of phrases that students who are English language learners might not necessarily understand. Again, in your resource section, resource two has common idioms and phrases, and resource three has academic terms. Again, not an exhaustive list, but if you wouldn't mind looking over it for about 30 seconds. Idioms that are not listed there, if you want to write them in, or you can just listen while I let you know some common idioms that are used in classrooms across age grade levels. Read along. Listen up. These are idioms that teachers are using, and maybe our students are not understanding what they mean. <coughs> read it over. Read into. When students are asked to read into the text, what does that mean? So we need to make sure they understand what that means. Sign off, sign out, take a break, take a chance, take a shot and write up. When we ask our students to write up something, and I never really put that much stock into idioms until I was teaching second grade and I was reading a story about Biscuit. Anybody know Biscuit, the little puppy dog? And Biscuit was digging up a bone. So I'm reading to all my second graders and they say, Miss, that doesn't make any sense. He's digging up a bone. We dig down. And I was like, oh, okay, wow, that just hits you like a ton of bricks when you have 27 sets of eyeballs looking at you saying, what you're reading to us doesn't make sense because we don't dig up, we dig down. So thinking about how idioms, even in a story about Biscuit, and you can see the picture in that he's digging the bone out of the ground, still needed to be clarified. So idioms can trip students up, and we need to make sure that they are taught, explained, and scaffolded. So there's also multiple meaning words or polysemous words. I don't know how many of you in here have learned a second or third or fourth language, but in English there are some tricky spots. In polysemous or polysemous, I like to say polysemous because the other word sounds like something else. So poly meaning many and semous meaning many, polysemous words. These are not homographs or homophones. These aren't words that just happen to look the same, like rebel and rebel, but we pronounce them differently. They're not just words that happen to sound the same, like two, 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 or there, there, there. These are words that are exactly the same. They look the same and they sound the exact same. This example of light. There is too much light in this room. Paco's suitcase is light. Oh my gosh, Paco's suitcase is very light. Grandma's sweater is light blue. The baby is a light sleeper. So. Not, not understanding all of the context of light and certainly not knowing what context I'm going to be expected to know going into a text, I can very easily be tripped up by something like this. My other favorite polysemous word, I'll just share it with you, is trunk. Because if you think about trunk, it has a lot of different meanings. There's an elephant's trunk and a tree trunk. In the good old days, when the operator would get called and have to pull that thing out and stick that thing in to make a call, that was called a trunk. I learned that. Uh, there's the car trunk, the trunk that you might pack the suitcase, swim trunks, that's kind of cheating because I added an S, and then of course my favorite, junk in the trunk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, who's having fun now? All right. Oh, sorry. Spencer, Spencer has a mic on me and he's about to just, his eardrums are about to explode. Okay. So when your teachers are provided this training, that's the amount of research that they're going to get. I've spoken with some of your coaches, they're going to be divvying up the training depending on the amount of time that they're able to meet with the teachers, and so I suggested that here is a good place for them to stop if they only have about an hour, and then to pick up with the next part for the second hour, which is going to be the actual application piece where we're going to work on the six-step routine. So is everybody ready? That was rhetorical. All right. <laughs> My husband is a Marine, was in the Marine Corps for 20 years, and he likes to say Marines have lots of P's, and that's proper prior preparation, prevent poor performance, and that is exactly what we have to have if we are going to be successful in vocabulary instruction. Before reading, proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. 
We need to make sure that we have selected the words that we are going to teach, that we have screened the entire text so that we know if students are going to have trouble with a word, that we can either give them that word in advance or know that we will have to do something during reading. The before reading is really one of the most complicated parts because choosing words is not easy. It's really not. And if you will look at resource number four, resource four is called Selecting Vocabulary Words Planning for Instruction. And for those of you who know about Louisa, uh, Louisa Motes, Isabel Beck, McGowan, Linda Kukin, they have the, word, the book Bringing Words to Life. It just, they just came out with a second edition. Isabel Beck has done a tremendous amount of work in the, in the idea or the notion of leveling or tiering words. On this handout, you can see that the level two words is really where we're going to focus our attention for our vocabulary routine. Level one words are those words that are pretty common, familiar words, baby, happy, son, book, words that we expect all students will know and be successful with. Tier three words are those words that are very content specific, photosynthesis, barometer, things that are very meaningful and absolutely you have to know them, but they're very specific to this one content or to this one chapter or to this one unit. So for our explicit vocabulary routine, we're going to focus where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck, which is these level or tier two words. If you will look on that resource and down to the fourth bullet, level two words include words that will be frequently encountered in other texts and content areas, are crucial to understanding the main ideas, are not a part of the student's prior knowledge, and are unlikely to be learned independently through the use of context or structural analysis. <coughs> Really what we want our teachers asking themselves as they're choosing words, is this word critical for my students' understanding of the text? If the answer to that question is yes, then we want to put it into the tier two category and dig a little bit deeper. How are we going to dig a little bit deeper? We're going to go into the text, we're going to look through the words that are in the text, see if some of those words are going to be very explicitly taught in the text, and if that is the case, then we can maybe move them off that list but our list needs to be set based on those things that students need to, to know that it's critical for understanding of the text. So here is the six step routine. And I just want to point out that even though it says, for example, have students say the word period, there are many other things that teachers should be doing in step one. How that should look is, as the teacher, I should say the word first because I know how to pronounce that word. Then I would ask my students to echo, and I would have them say the word several times before I would then show them the word, written out so that they can see how those sounds that they just produced map to the graphemes that spell out the word. So even though it's just has students say the word, there are lots of other things that go into step one. Step two, provide a definition of the word. And this usually needs to be something that's student friendly so that we don't have to explain that next word and then that next word and <coughs> then we've lost sight of the word. So using friendly, student friendly ex explanations and visuals as they support the word. Have students talk about the word using the word and what it is that they know about the word providing examples and non-examples of the word. And we should really make sure that our teachers are providing lots of examples at the very beginning and as the students start to understand the word a little more, bringing in some non-examples. The research is starting to show that if you provide too many non-examples and not enough strong examples or examples that don't match at all to what it is that the concept is that you're teaching, then it's just a waste of time. And I know I've actually had some secondary students ask their teacher, why are you bothering telling me what it's not? Let's talk about what it is. So that's also a really interesting thing when you think about examples. So if you think about attributes, perpendicular lines. Perpendicular lines are straight lines that intersect at a 90 degree angle. So three attributes. They have to be straight lines, they have to intersect, and they have to be at a 90 degree ang angle at that intersection. If we start talking about squiggly circles, there are no attributes that are similar. That's not even a non-example. That's on the different plane. So we should pick a non-example like perpendicular lines. Two lines that are straight, but they're running in the same direction. So shared attributes. 
So if you're in a classroom and a teacher is explaining hot and her, her non-example is cold or big and little, we all know those are called opposites. We really need to focus on things that are examples and non-examples, not opposites when we're talking about vocabulary. Then, okay, so usually when I see, when I walk in the classroom and I have done a million technical <coughs> assistance visits, not a million really, more like 1,650, uh, I see teachers stop after step four. Teachers will tell the students the words, they'll give them a definition, they'll talk about what it is, what it's not, maybe even show them a picture, have them talk about the word, and then that's it. And really, where we need those instructional encounters is steps five and six. We need to do some deep processing. We need to think about that word, compare it to things that have similar but not exactly the same attributes. We need to think about why this word is what it is and what happens to that word if we add an ED or we add an ING and how does that word change and morph over time. We need some deep processing and not just, you'll see that word when we get into the text and then you'll know what it means. We also need to make sure that we're providing scaffolds so that students will create sentences that are powerful. And we call those seven up sentences. And that means that the, the sentence can't have fewer than seven words in it. And I know I've had some secondary teachers say, but my students should be writing longer sentences. It's about quality, not quantity. So the minimum is seven. So you're not gonna say, the word is concrete and here's my sentence, I like concrete. I eat concrete. My brother is concrete. Can y'all tell I taught third grade? So we really need to think about ways that we can scaffold for some students. And you know there are some students out there who come in and you say, here's the word, here's what it means, and they have that word and they own it as if they've been owning it for 25 years, even though they're 12. But there are other students who really need a lot of explicit instruction, a lot of scaffolding, a sentence starter, for example. When you're asking to create a sentence that seven words are up, let's give them a few words to start out with. All right, so we are going to, maybe, I don't know where my stuff went. It was here, there it is. We are going to practice this routine using a word that will not be new, but it'll be fun. Are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Do y'all need to stand up, do some jumping jacks? No, you're good? Okay. Here's our word for the day. Are you ready? The word is whale. What's the word? Whale. Say it loud, say it proud. Whale. The word is whale. What's the word? And sometimes with teachers, we have to be careful, too, because we might say the word is whale. So we just want to make sure that we're... <laughs> That's a whole other training, and we'll meet here tomorrow to talk about it. All right. So here's the word whale. What's the word? Whale. Read this word with me. Whale. Say it loud. Say it proud. Whale. Read it like a whole word. Whale. Okay. So you can see how it's important to not just say the word, say the word, say the word, but students need to see the word. They need to maybe even spell the word, write the word, because some of you might have been thinking about a mammal that lives in the water, and as soon as I showed you this, you said, oh, okay, whale. So step one in our routine. Step two, I'm going to show you a visual, and I'm going to say, to whale means to cry loudly for a long time. What does whale mean? To cry loudly for a long time. So I have just given you two attributes for whale. To cry loudly and to cry for a long time. So I wonder if any of you have ever had any experience with whale. Maybe you knew someone who did whale or a time that you did whale. And what you're hearing me do right now is use the word whale. I'm not saying whales, I'm not saying whales, I'm not saying whaling, I'm saying whale. And when our teachers introduce our words, they need to be exactly what the word is that we are introducing. On down the line, I can start adding suffixes and I can start talking a little bit more about morphing this word into something else. But first out of the shoot, we're talking about whale and that's what I'm gonna do. Even if it sounds a little weird that I have to keep saying, is there a time that you did whale? Because I don't want to say, is there a time you wailed? Because now I've changed the word into a past tense verb. That's another thing that we want our teachers doing at the time that they introduce the word. It's a verb. It's something you can do. You can also cry loudly for a long period of time. I'm not sure a lot of you in here would do that. You wouldn't want to wail on your campuses until after hours. OK, so think about. What you've seen so far, we have a visual. Now I'm going to ask you that at your tables with your partners, just very quickly talk a little bit about what you know about the word 
wail. What's the word? Wail. And what does it mean? To cry loudly for a long time. Okay, 30 seconds. Have some fun talking about wail. Now, I, I was walking around and I heard some people engaged in the activity, but what I did notice is for those of you who were engaged in the activity, you were saying the word wail. That's important. We want our students using the word, talking about the word. If we're walking around and our students are talking about things that are not the word that we're introducing, then we need to redirect them and make sure that our teachers are doing that so that they're on task and using the word. Because remember, if they don't pronounce the word, if they don't produce the word, they're not going to use the word. So now, just for fun, let's talk about some examples and non-examples. If you hit your finger with a hammer, would you wail? Yes, thumbs up, or no, thumbs down? Some of the, you're so brave. What is it about you? He wouldn't wail. He wouldn't cry loudly for a long period of time. Would you shed a little tiny tear? He'd curse loudly for a long period of time. <laughs> what, is, what would that word be? I'm not exactly sure. Bellow? No. Okay, after seeing the sad movie, a tear rolled down the woman's cheek. Did she wail? Did she cry for a long time? Maybe, but did she cry loudly for a long time? No, so thumbs down. Thumbs down. All right, how about this? Does a young child wail when he doesn't get what he wants at the Walmart checkout line? Thumbs up, yes, thumbs down. Are, have you ever been behind that child with only one item and wishing, my gosh, why did I come to Walmart today? <laughs> She's giving me super thumbs up, triple thumbs up. Okay, how about this? When his best friend moved away, the boy cried quietly into his pillow. Did he wail? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Yes, no, because we can all just say no. Thumbs down. He, he didn't wail. Did he cry? Maybe for a long time, but did he cry loudly? So we're having conversation and we're actually kind of doing a little bit of that deep processing. We're doing comparing and contrasting of attributes. So he cried and maybe he could have cried for a long time, but he did not cry loudly for a long period of time. So he did not wail. How about this? The baby screamed and cried for 10 minutes after she got her shots. Did she wail? Okay. And this is a great conversation and even more deep processing for students because some people, maybe in second grade, might say, my mom's always talking, I have 10 minutes to play, and that doesn't seem like a very long time, so I think that maybe she cried, but she didn't cry for her. She cried loudly, but not for a long period of time. So is 10 minutes a long period of time to be crying? Most likely. And so this is a conversation that we can be having in order to engage into that rich discussion that we were discussing earlier. All right, how about this? Uh, I saw tears on the football player's cheeks when his team lost the Super Bowl. Did he cry? Did he wail? Did his agent wail? Yeah, his agent probably did wail. Probably cried loudly for a, oh my gosh, cried loudly for a long period of time. How many times can you do this in one day? Okay, so now, oh, she can get out of this table. I'm going to stand over here. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to have partner A, partner B, so if you can kind of get with the people that you were discussing before, discussing with before, and if you have three people, can you just have one A and two Bs? So partner A, where are you? Raise your hand. Partner B, where are you? Raise your hand. Okay, very good. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on, and I'm going to ask you to um, create a couple of sentences. They're going to be complete sentences, and I'm going to scaffold you by saying, partner A, please turn to partner B or partner B's um, and complete this thought. I would wail if. I would wail if and then complete that thought. Partner A, turn to partner B's and go. <laughs> Together in five, four, three, to, okay, partner B, if, if anyone is uh, so brave as to share out, I just have to come stand close to you because of the whole filming thing. So partner B, do you want to share out what partner A said? <laughs> Nobody really wants to share out what their friends said? <laughs> All right, I'll tell something that I heard. And when your uh, teachers are asking your students to share out, they really need to be speaking in complete sentences. And so I would have told partner B that you're going to say, my partner said that he would wail if, or that she would wail if. So, not my partner, because I was eavesdropping on another conversation, said he would wail if his wife left him. And I thought that was so sweet. <laughs> <clears throat> what is happening up here? <laughs> okay, 
Partner B, you're not off the hook, even if you didn't want to share out what Partner A said, because Partner B, now you're going to turn to Partner A and complete this thought. I would never wail if. And complete your thought. And some of you have two Bs, so both Bs need to share. Go. I'm just going to share what I heard, even though, like I said, we should be scaffolding complete sentences, and so we want to say, I heard my partner say, or my partner said she would never wail if. But I did hear... Um, as I was eavesdropping, someone's partner say she would never wail if her husband left her. <laughs> so to each his own, I think, is really the, the moral of that story. Oh, and they're on camera. I was just repeating what I heard. <laughs> OK, so if you would very quickly look um, Behind your handout tab, you have handout one. You have a lot of these um, everywhere so that we can start using them. This routine for explicit vocabulary instruction, this is handout one. You also have, as I pointed out at the beginning, your cards on rings and your laminated front back card. Front side is English, back side is Spanish, same as in the handouts. In your cards on rings, what you have are six sets of the routine. The first set is in English on the white and it's blank. The second set is the word coax in English, so an example with a verb. And then the yellow set solar, an example with an adjective. And then moving on to Spanish, you have a blank Spanish set. You have a blue Spanish set with the verb admirar. And then you also have yellow with an adjective solar. So. These are the materials that your teachers will be receiving when they receive this vocabulary and oral language development training. That is a great question, and I will let Becky um, talk about that and Kathy talk about that as soon as I'm done, because I don't know the answer. All right. Um, I did talk a lot earlier this morning about resource five. If you wouldn't mind, I know I'm having you flip through here, but resource five is a bunch of graphic organizers. And graphic organizers can be good and they can be supportive or they can be a waste of students' time. So what I would like to caution all of our teachers is if they're using a graphic organizer, it needs to be meaningful. Not just every week the students know they're going to fill out this one graphic organizer and they don't have any support, they don't have any scaffolding, they're not sitting with a partner, or they're not working through it as the week progresses. They're just handed on Monday and expected to hand it in on Friday. Graphic organizers are not just glorified worksheets. Graphic organizers are places where students can think, where they can record their thinking, and where they can expand on their thinking. And so if your teacher are using graphic organizers, they need to be making sure they're using them appropriately and in a meaningful way. OK. How are we on time? Oh, I'm doing great on time, y'all. It's only been an hour. And I have a whole hour to go. Are you excited? <sighs> I'm going to do proximity control on this one. OK, ready to move to what I like to call the during reading section. So teachers have gone through this explicit routine. What's important for you to know that your teachers are going to do is that they're going to go through steps one through four on the first day. So let's say they have eight words that they're introducing. They're going to take all eight words through steps one through four, and then they're going to take one word or two words on, let's say, Monday, all the way through the six. The next day, let's just keep on with the week and say it's Tuesday, they're going to choose two other words to take through steps five and six. The reason that it's set out that way is that there's no way to take eight words or ten words through all six steps on Monday and have time to do anything else. So steps one through four will happen on the first day they introduce the words, and then five and six will happen a couple or, or one or a couple on the first day and then throughout the rest of the week. During reading, your students will need to be supported so that they can continue to develop and grow in the vocabulary instruction that they have been receiving across the week. So as they are in the text, the teachers can have them stop and listen for the new words that they have been introduced to. So they can do a thumbs up if they hear the word. We also have pinch cards 
But I'll be going through, you don't need to get these out right now. I'll just show you right now and then we'll go through these again at the very end. But pinch cards that students can use. So we have the words that the students would pinch. So we're just going to be reading the story. We're going to get to the word whale. The students are going to hear it and they're going to silently lift up their pinch card and show that they heard the word whale in the context of the connected text. So they're going to be listening for that. I've seen teachers just do a thumbs up that we came to a word that was in our vocabulary list and I heard that word spoken aloud or read aloud or I read that word aloud. Okay, so the students are reading and the other students are listening for the vocabulary words. We're of course going to allow students to continue to discuss the words and we're going to help scaffold them through that graphic organizer by continuing to do visuals, continuing to complete the graphic organizer throughout the week. There are other ways to support vocabulary that are not necessarily on this routine card. Remember earlier I was talking about some of those words that when you get into the text and you realize I don't really need to put that word through an entire routine because it's not necessarily a tier two word, but it's certainly a word my students need to know. We want our students to do something called parallel language or pairing in language. And all that is is just providing students with a quick definition of the word that you've come to knowing that your students need a little bit more scaffolding or a little more support. So what that would look like is that you would kind of train your students to understand your signal. I've seen teachers who step out of the text with a thumbs up. I've seen teachers who step out of the text with palm open. It doesn't matter what the signal is, but there does need to be a signal because you know that one little kid is going to say, well, she's reading words not in the text. Yes, she's reading words not in the text to support your understanding, and so the teacher needs to make sure to give a signal. So for example, if the word is whale, and it wasn't one of our tier two words, I would read and come to the word whale to cry loudly for a long period of time. Then he, and they would continue reading. It's just parallel language or pairing in language, and it's a really great strategy for during reading for those words that we cannot, we can't put all 25 words that students need to know through the explicit vocabulary routine every week. It's just not gonna work. So we need to pick the words that are best supported with parallel language or pairing in language. Okay, and I think that's all for during reading. So let's get to the fun part, after reading. And one of the things I think is important is I'm going to the before reading and the during reading and the after reading. What I need to say is that your teachers need to have a reason for reading. The reason for reading is not because I wrote it in my lesson plans. The reason for reading is that there's an objective that I have set for why we will be reading this text today. So if the objective of reading the text is to stop at the vocabulary words that I did put through the routine and talk about them a little more, work on the graphic organizer and visual, and expound a little bit more on that deep processing skill, then that's what I'm going to do. If my goal is to read all the way connected text from the start to the finish, then that's what I need to have set as my goal and my objective. There should be a different objective for reading when teachers are thinking about vocabulary instruction. It shouldn't be, I need to only read through the connected text, or I need to stop at every vocabulary word. That objective should be known to the teacher, and then the teacher should make that objective known to the students so that they will understand the expectation, and they can do that ex the exact same routine every, every week. On Tuesday, what we're gonna do is we're gonna read through the story and we're gonna stop at vocabulary and talk about it a little bit more to expound on what we did yesterday when we learned those vocabulary words for the first time. On Wednesday, we're gonna do a straight read all the way through, beginning to end, because we wanna hear the, the story in its entirety and we wanna make sure that that story is connected. And as the teacher, I'm just gonna parallel language if and when necessary. On Thursday, I have a different objective. So there are multiple objectives throughout the week for reading and that are both supportive of vocabulary instruction and supportive of comprehension and connected text reading. Okay, so after reading, we're gonna review the words in a variety of different ways. This is really where, where I think it's a lot of fun for students because they can do things with words that they have been working on and learning through the week in connected text and they can take them back out of connected text Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. When they see them back in the connected text, they're going to start making those deep neural pathways that we talked about at the beginning. So you have this explanation sheet for some vocabulary activities. You also have a polyurethane pocket on your table, and of course we love to call it a poly pocket, because what would education be without some cutesy names? So poly pocket on your table with these activities. So if you would please open up your poly pocket, 
and take out your materials. And the first activity on the list is called SWAT slap. We were talking earlier about secondary um, students and maybe we would call it something else because SWAT and slap is encouraging some not good behavior. Um, but all it is, as you can see, are cards that have pictures. So the yellow cards have pictures for SWAT slap. The red cards have words and the pink cards have the definitions. And this is a scaffold in and of itself. So if you've pulled a small group, so if you're in the classroom and you see a teacher working in a small group, and this is first grade, second grade, and they've taught the vocabulary, they've supported the vocabulary with the picture, and now they're asking students to identify the vocabulary word by looking at the pictures, they'll say, I'm looking for whale. And the student will slap the crying baby. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that was so unplanned, and I love it. Uh, I'm looking for a word that means how heavy something is, and they'll slap the picture of weight. Now, of course, this would be scaffolded up by using the words because the students would need to be able to read the words. So I'm looking for something that means men, women, and children, and they would slap humans. And then, of course, this is the highest level where they're having to read the vocabulary definitions, and you would say, find, the, find whale, and they would have to slap crying loudly for a long time. Now, how you would play this in places where students might actually swat and slap each other, and I've seen this done in the classroom in middle school, is that the words are in the middle of the board and the kids have fly swatters and, it, and they just slap the word. If that is too chaotic in your middle school, then they have one set of words over here and one set of words over here and the students are on completely opposite sides of the board and they have the fly swatter and they can swat and slap or they can just use their hands, or they can erase the word. Um, we're in the middle of finishing up a research project with high schoolers who, by the way, loved almost every single one of these games. And with our 10th graders, we would have them do a, uh, what is it called? Here it is, a study guide. So this is just their sheet. This is not a pinch card, but this is just a study guide. And on the front, they would have the word. On the back, they would have definition, sentence, illustration, antonym, anything that helps them think about the word and anything they connected to the word throughout the week. And then when we played SWAT slap, all we said was, find the word that means men, women, and children, and they would just take their pins and tap it, or take their finger and tap it. So you can play it, it doesn't necessarily have to be called SWAT slap, but your teachers can play it at any age grade level. Another thing that's, the next one in line is I have who has, and I will tell you that our 10th graders ate this one up. I also have a friend who saw a fourth grade class do 500 words in under nine minutes. So, and it was all of course words that have been taught. Words that have been taught. We don't go to Lake Shore and buy a box of I have who has and bring it out because as you'll see in a minute when we actually play this game it's really hard if the words have not been taught. So you have an example, well you don't have an example, I have an example, you have an example in your uh, Polly Pocket, but you don't have an example to take with you, of I have who has from our 10th grade um, class where we were talking about energy levels and compound and fuse and ignite and calibrate and emit. And so all we did was put it into a Word document in a table, print it out, and then cut it into strips and put them in plastic bags. These, of course, are beautiful because they're for training purposes, but we really hope that teachers will just get to the level where they can do it quickly and efficiently and have six or seven sets so that students can get into small groups and play I have who has. I also have a friend who taught fifth grade who said you have to be careful because sometimes, not students in Arlington ISD, but sometimes students fight about who gets to go first. So her, her I have who has starts out, I have the first card. Who has the word that means made up of two or more parts, elements, or ingredients? How, we are, how you play this game is you start with who has, unless you say I have the first card, who has this and the person who has that say I have compound. Who has the word that means a cord, rope, etc. that is lit to start an explosive? I have fuse. So what I would like for you to do right now is to please get out your I have who has cards and pass them out at your tables until they're all passed out. So if there are two of you, you're going to get a lot, and if there are 
Seven of you, you're going to get one. And just so there's no fighting about who goes first, and because I know you like the word whale at this point, if you have the card that says, I have whale, I would like for you to start by saying, who has quickly? And go. You mind. <laughs> Two, one. And I think that it's important not only that I point out that the words need to be pre taught and that they need to be, this is a review of vocabulary, but also what you have here is the answer and then the definition. So students can get tripped up, for example, who has quickly. Quickly is the definition for swiftly. And so you will use, not only will you have pre taught these, your teachers will have pre taught these, but they will use the same definitions that they have taught so that the students are successful. And when you say, I have quickly, the person will say, I have swiftly, who has, okay. So the next thing, okay, so we can put those away. And y'all did a great job. Thank you for participating. I know it's been a long day. We're almost there. The next thing on your list is pinch cards. I, I kind of talked a little bit about pinch cards during um, the during reading section. But you can see here, once again, these are scaffolded. So we have pictures and words, and then we have words and definitions. So if your students are in kindergarten, they are still able to relate to pictures. If they're in pre-K, we can still, not this many pictures on one card, mind you, but why pinch cards are called pinch cards is that we have the exact same thing on the front that we have on the back. So students aren't trying to read upside down. I think only really educators can read upside down. Students need to be reading right side up. So if you want them to pinch swiftly, They'll pinch it on this side and they can read it and you can see on this side. So when the teachers are out up here and they're assessing what's going on, they can say, I want you to pinch the word that means to cry loudly for a long time. They also, once again, need to have a routine for this because you'll have smarty britches holding up whale right away. I'm sorry that I said that. Um, you'll have a really smart person holding up their card right away. Now I'm just picking on you. You want to have a, they want to have a routine in place. And so you'll say, remember, I'm going to count down three, two, one, show me. And that's when you're going to show me your pinch card. I want you to pick the word that means to cry loudly for a long period of time. Three, two, one, show me. And they'll hold it up. Now, what this is, is wait time for students who need to actually read through the words and find the word, a little bit of processing time. And also, you'll have everyone doing it at the same time. Now, you might have some kids pinch in the middle or pinch with an inappropriate finger, but we'll just teach them how to do it. Because I will tell you that this is a quick assessment for a teacher to be able to see who's got it and who doesn't have it. So then I had a college professor once when I was doing this training with him point out that we have clickers and we're way more advanced than pinch cards. And yes, you might have clickers, but I don't have time to disaggregate data and do an item analysis to figure out who accidentally pinched pinch swiftly instead of whale. So yes, the clickers are fine if I want to get an aggregate score of what my students know and don't know, but to get it down to the level of you got it and you didn't, I can just do pinch cards very quickly and that's at all age grade levels once again. Okay. Like I said, I realize that this does look like a pinch card, but really this is a study aid, and we would have our students keep data and keep adding data and keep adding data through the week on the vocabulary words. They would take it home on Thursday and come on Friday prepared for the quiz. Then we would take this and put it into their vocabulary binders so they were able to keep their vocabulary binders. All right. Next on the list, vocabulary checklist. These two cards here. So the orange card only has six word, uh, enough room for six words, and the green card has enough room for eight words. This one is for more elementary. The green one is for more secondary. And this is basically just an accountability system for when you have students read. I don't know if in Arlington ISD you do Dear Time or if you do whatever it's called. Anytime your students are reading in the library workstation or library center, my students actually used to sit there and do what I like to call fish out of water, where they were but they weren't actually reading any text. And so in order to make sure that we don't have, I'm sure that nothing like that happens in Arlington, but no fish out of water, so we're going to hold them accountable by asking them to do a vocabulary checklist. Six words, three columns for elementary, so they have to choose six words. Two of those words have to be words they know well. Two of those words have to be words they know of or have heard of. And two of those words have to be words they don't know anything about for our 
Upper elementary and certainly through secondary, they have eight words, four columns, because two of those words would be level four, level three, level two, level one. Then what's very lovely about this is that teachers can go and say, I noticed that you said you knew these two, two words extremely well, and I noticed that she said she didn't know these two words at all, so I'm going to pair the two of you up and you're going to teach each other these words because those two words that you said you knew really well, he had on his level one checklist. If that doesn't work in the classroom, the teacher still has an accountability system to say, these are words, you're choosing words that you have only heard of or that you know nothing about that I've been teaching, so I need to go back and make sure I do a reteach with you because everyone else is selecting those words as words they know. So that's vocabulary checklist. Word tagger bracelets. I told you there was a game that my secondary students didn't like to play, and this was it. For some reason, secondary students don't like to wear this around their necks <laughs> and walk around the campus. I don't know why. Elementary kids love it. So this kind of makes you the word wizard or the word warrior or whatever you want to call it, but you are responsible for this word and you are responsible for taking this word out into the school. The hard part about playing this game is making sure the other adults in the building know about this game because as a principal, you're going to want to walk up to this student and say, what can you tell me about talent? Or it could be reversed and the child is allowed to ask the principal or the librarian or another adult that he or she comes across can you tell me about a special talent that you have? At the end of the day or at the next class period when they all come back together, then they get to share out what they learned about Mr. King or about the librarian or whomever it is. Um, secondary students are not averse to wearing those plastic bracelets. So you can get those plastic, plastic bracelets and put the words on there. They're just a lot harder to see and a lot harder to spot, so it's not as much fun. But that's what word tag or bracelets is, and then this, when the students share out, then they become responsible for that word. So if I had the student in my class who had the word talent, and then I would say, I can't read very far today, Julie, you were in charge of talent, can you write your name on the back of this and put it back on the word wall? So then let's say that I'm having problems remembering what the word talent is, I go over to the word wall or wherever we're keeping our words, I'm like, talent, talent, Julie, you're responsible for this word. Can you please help me understand what it is? So it's not always the teacher having all the knowledge, but now we're sharing knowledge, empowering the students to share in their learning and in teaching other students. Vocabulary quick write folder is the last one in the after reading list. You have two examples. You have Luke goes to bat for elementary and you have the lady or the tiger for secondary. Inside are the words that we put through the explicit vocabulary routine on Monday and then through deep processing on Tuesday. And so what we might do is say, we've talked a lot about the word cheered and how Luke was cheered on in the story. I'm going to give you one minute to write what you know about the word cheered. I'm going to write, give you one minute to write a story using the word cheered three times. Okay, so we're going to do that and we're going to have one minute. Or the lady in the t or the tiger, we're going to talk about retribution and how we talked about retribution for what happened to him in the story. We also had some time to talk with our friends and our peers about a time that we actually went out and sought retribution. And so now you're going to do a quick write for three minutes about retribution and go. And you might have some students say, I don't know what to write. And so you say, good, write, I don't know what to write. And I can guarantee you after a child writes, I don't know what to write for three minutes, the next time they're going to just do the quick write. So, <laughs> You don't have to worry with students not engaging in these activities because they are meaningful and if the words have been emphasized and their meanings have been emphasized and taught throughout the week, they're going to want to be successful and they're going to want to be able to share their knowledge, not just with you, but with others and to show how much they know to themselves. So we have the routine here on the solar card. You have it once again on the solar cards in here. And so this is just an example of what it would look like if you walked in on a teacher doing the explicit vocabulary routine using the word solar. I'm just going to give you a minute to read through this slide and I'm going to move on to the next slide for the next two steps. On to the next steps. And moving on to the last two steps. Okay, 
right, and so then this morning what we did was that we had the coaches practice because they're going to have the teachers practice. And so if you happen to um, participate in the training that your teachers receive, then you'll see them have an opportunity to look at handout two and to choose a word and actually take time to plan the word and teach the word in the way that they would have just taught the word solar. So usually partner A taught partner B, and now partner B would choose a word from handout two. I feel like that would be something that you would like to observe your teachers doing and not actually practice right now. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the final slides about things to remember about vocabulary instruction. So vocabulary should be taught throughout the day. By the way, let me go back just a second. That's why this training would need two hours because it would take another at least 15 or 20 minutes to go ahead and allow them time to practice. Looks like we're going to get out a little bit early today. So, um, But they would need the time to do that in order to get the words out and actually practice the routine. It takes some time. Okay, so practicing throughout the day across content areas, making sure that we're supporting explicit instruction, creating opportunities in the classroom for students to talk about the words, use the words, communicate what they know about the words, and build on what they know about what it is that they're learning about the words. Using multiple strategies, just like the quote from the very beginning, we want it to be meaningful, rich and varied activities so that students can have ownership of words. Ensuring that students encounter new words across multiple time. Isabel Beck says 12 to 14 instructional encounters for students to gain ownership of the words. And in fact, in some cases with struggling readers and English language learners, this number can be as high as 40 instructional encounters in order for them to gain ownership of the word. I have a friend and she likes to say when teachers ask her how many times do I have to have an instructional encounter with the word with my students for them to get it, she likes to respond as many times as it takes. So that is really what vocabulary instruction is all about. We want to make sure that activities that we are asking students to engage in require them to know the attributes of the word, to know the relationships of the words, and to be able to determine how that word is used in context so that they are not just always receiving that language, but that we start seeing them expressing that in speaking and in writing. And that's it. Lovely. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. <laughs>